Today, our presentation will introduce you to renewable natural gas, also called BioCNG. My name is Ann Chaneyfeld. I'm Executive Director of Louisiana Clean Fuels. And uh, my presentation today will provide you with an overview of the Department of Energy's Clean Cities Program, alternative fuel incentives, and how and, and laws, as well as EPA emission standards. Um, after my presentation, Joanna Underwood, the president of Energy Vision, will give you an RNG primer, followed by Katri Martin of St. Landry Solid Waste, who will give you uh, a case study on landfill waste to fuel. And then Bob Lukefar, the CEO, co-CEO of NatG, will talk about fueling and vehicle options. Louisiana Clean Fuels is a nonprofit organization housed at the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources, and we became a designated affiliate of the U.S. Department of Energy's Clean Cities Program back in 2000. We're one of two Clean Cities coalitions in Louisiana, and we cover about 56 parishes. Um, Clean Cities coalitions are all across the country, so no matter where you do business, you're likely to have coverage from one of these organizations. So make sure you, you contact the local Clean Cities whenever you're out there. Okay, hold on. And these are the parishes that we cover in Louisiana. Okay. All right, the Alternative Fuels Programs um, that we cover about five technology areas is supported by Clean Cities Program. Okay. Um, Clean Cities coordinators are able to provide stakeholders with unbiased and objective resources about these technologies because Clean Cities is a fuel neutral program supported by all EPACT alternative fuels, including biodiesel, electricity, ethanol, hydrogen, natural gas, and propane. As you can see, Clean Cities programs go beyond alternative fuels and also include various petroleum reduction methods such as fuel blends, fuel economy, hybrid electric vehicles, and idle reduction technologies. Um, there's many different motivations that people may have to convert to alternative fuels. Um, many, for many people, it's patriotic. It's, you know, it's a domestic fuel and their energy security is very important to them. And with others, it's purely cost. But even with today's low oil prices, most of our fleets are moving to alternative fuels as a means to stabilize their fuel expenditures by diversifying their fleet fueling. And over the past 10 years, U.S. gasoline prices have fluctuated from below $2 a gallon to more than $4. In contrast, the United States' average vehicle age is more than 11 years. So when purchasing a vehicle and considering the cost of ownership, a buyer should remember that fuel cost may easily double during a vehicle's lifetime. And also the third motivation that many of the fleets have is, you know, emissions. It's clean. It's better for the environment. Um, and also specifically in the sector we're talking about today, EPA has recently tightened emission standards for methane, um, especially for landfills. So this is a very timely issue today. You may be wondering um, what type of alternative fuels operate in Louisiana. Our, our fuel mix is greatly diversified. Each year, we ask our stakeholders to report on their alternative vehicles and equipment, as well as their fuel savings activities. And in 2014, Louisiana Clean Fuels was recognized by the Department of Energy for the diversity in fuels of our state's portfolio. We also rec um, rank among the top renewable natural gas performers in the country, thanks to St. Landry Parish's landfill gas program. Okay, why renewable natural gas? Um, it's, we're going to be covering this and discussing this in great detail today, and it's produced by converting the biogases emitted from decomposing organic material, and it's chemically similar to natural gas. So that's it in very most basic nutshell right there. And why is this important today? Um, EPA is, is ever tightening the standards on emissions, and just recently they released some information on landfill gas emissions. We have this right here for you. We're um, not going to go into this in much detail, but you can go to this website. We have the link here, and you can find out what the different um, emission standards are and recommendations are for landfills. Recently, um, at the last legislative session, alternative fuels tax credits were, were cut. Um, almost all the tax credits were cut across the board in the state of Louisiana. So this is the new amounts. So 
everything has been reduced to 36%. State income tax credit is 30%, 6% of the incremental cost of the purchasing the equipment, um, cost of the converting the vehicle, or the equipment itself. If you want some more details or if you have specific questions um, about you know, which things may apply, you need to contact William Little with the Department of um, Revenue, and he can answer your specific questions about this act. On another front, we're, the decal program is going to end beginning January 1st, and the tax levied on special fuels will no longer be paid once every July by purchasing the sticker that used to be put in the window when you operate alternative fuels. Instead, it'll be much more similar to the way it is taxed for, um, for gasoline at the pump. And the rates that we have are in here. They, we have the diesel gallon equivalent for liquefied natural gas, the gallon gas equivalent for compressed natural gas. And uh, we have a little bit more information here. And if you have specific questions about what this means to you, if you operate um, a fueling station, if you have a public or a private fleet, you need to contact Shanda McLean. And she will give you some information about what the changes mean, how it's going to happen. When you buy your decal this July, you will buy it for an entire year. But when January 1st rolls around, you will get a refund um, for the unused portion of the year when the new system rolls over. Again, please reach out to Shanda McLean at the Department of Revenue if you have specific questions about this because uh, it is still in the rulemaking process right now. So you will actually be able to get a voice potentially and um, some of the specifics on how this will be enacted. We have some basic resources here uh, for clean cities. Alternative Fuel Data Center is, is wonderful. Uh, FuelEconomy.gov, clean, clean Cities website has some great information. We have um, case studies and technical information available for you. And if you have a technical question, uh, if you have an issue that's, that you're having problems you know, getting resolved and you just need a little bit of extra help, you maybe not know who to turn to, you can go to the Clean Cities Technical Response Service. This is a free service. Just mention that your um, Louisiana Clean Fuels, your local clean cities, mentioned um, that you're working with them and they can help you. And also the Department of Natural Resources. Um, the AFDC station locator um, is one of the, is a tool that I just want to make sure everyone knows about. You can do this online. You can get it on your app. So if you're out there and you need to know where a compressed natural gas EV station is, where propane fueling is, you can go here and um, it gives you directions and it can even give you a picture of the site. That's it for me today. We're, um, we're going to move you next to Joanna Underwood with Energy Vision. Good morning. This is Joanna Underwood, and we are very pleased to be helping to organize and uh, to work with Louisiana Clean Fuels on this webinar and on exploring in Louisiana in general the potential for converting organic waste into the clean, renewable form of natural gas. We are especially pleased to be sharing this program with Katri Martin, who has been one of the real pioneers, not just in Louisiana, but in the country, in initiating a municipal waste to fuels program. Uh, we toured his site yesterday, and you will hear all about it from him and the finances of it and the savings and the environmental benefits. Um, and we hope that that example will inspire many communities across Louisiana to want to look at the same thing, the same way of turning what has been considered waste into a very valuable fuel resource. Um, what is valuable about organic waste, of course, is that it isn't a waste at all. Now, Energy Vision, which is a national nonprofit organization based in New York City, we have been looking at alternative fuels uh, given the population growing in our world, given the environmental pressures, the more clean fuel opportunities we have, the better. We look at all of them, but one of the fuels that we have identified that comes closest right now to meeting all the requirements for sustainability is waste-based renewable natural gas fuel. And it specifically can be used 
to power millions of the buses and trucks, other heavy-duty vehicles on our country's roadways. It can be used for cars too, but when you convert a refuse truck, which goes gets about 2.8 miles per gallon, you are saving a lot of fuel and it is less costly. And Katri will talk about the extraordinarily low cost of producing and delivering this fuel today in his area. Um, this fuel, yes, has only begun to emerge in the last seven or eight years. There were hardly any projects that were converting, converting waste to fuel a decade ago. Energy Vision has been tracking them, promoting them, and has been perhaps the lead independent sector educator of Americans on this fuel. We run regional uh, workshops, day-long workshops. We have published a guide for steps every community can take to explore their renewable natural gas opportunities to find out where all of their uh, organic wastes are located in municipalities, in food processing plants, from college campuses, from hotels, from, I think, in Louisiana, crawfish farms. Any place where you're processing organic food, you're generating yard waste, you're generating food waste, there you have the feedstock for making this fuel. And there is a lot of it all over the country in urban and rural areas, which is an exciting fact. It's very exciting because we need jobs all over this country, and especially in rural areas where there are dairies and farms, um, you can create jobs there too. Um, how can biogases be used? They can be used in three ways that you collect from these organics. <clears throat> and anywhere organics break down, they are generating methane gas. If you don't collect them and use them, they will escape as greenhouse gases, powerful ones. So collecting them is both a step forward in addressing the climate change threats that we face. It's also a way of harnessing a resource for uh, several uses. You can use the biogases to generate heat in homes or buildings or power plants. You can generate power. You can refine the biogases to take out some of the water and uh, siloxanes and other impurities, and then you end up with a natural gas that is good to power vehicles. We believe from our research across the country that turning that waste into vehicle fuel is the biggest, highest use of it, since buses and trucks that generate a lot of emissions in cities and travel round and around, you've got a cleaner option for these. Um, you have very heavy fuel using fleets. And when you use compressed natural gas, you can reduce greenhouse gases by about 25% compared to diesel. But when you use renewable natural gas, because you make it from cap captured methane, you can reduce your greenhouse gases by 90% or more. There are just five quite simple steps to converting waste into vehicle fuel. You start with the organic material. It either goes into landfills from which you extract the biogas, or it goes into special tanks called anaerobic digesters. And there, when you put the organics in, you both collect the gases for use, but you also have the biosolids that are left which can be used to produce compost or soil amendments. If you're going to make really good vehicle fuel, then you take the biogases and you upgrade them, remove the carbon dioxide and impurities. You then can send that fuel to fueling stations. You can have fueling stations on the site uh, where the fuel is produced, or it can be uh, shipped by truck or through pipeline to off-site pumps. And finally, you have to have the vehicles that are able to use natural gas technology, and those are very sophisticated engines, a larger and larger variety of them every year. Uh, so this five-step process of turning waste into fuel is not rocket science. Everything can be done commercially today. 
the real challenges to creating projects are your financing and your logistics. Those are the challenges. I show this next slide very quickly just to show you that the waste to fuel industry, which barely existed a decade ago, is growing rapidly. There are the companies that are converting landfill gas to fuel, that are gas refiners, that build these tanks called anaerobic digesters, that design natural gas vehicles, that create refueling stations. This is a chart worth looking at because the number of companies in this industry is growing and the number of planning and consulting firms that can help communities develop a program are also growing. The drivers for this, I've mentioned a little bit on the way, saving of money, you'll hear more about that on the St. Landry Parish project, the state and federal programs and regulations which provide funding incentives You'll hear more about that. There is the leveraging of a more mature market. You have now a pipeline network. You have storage capabilities. You have refueling. Um, so there are many drivers for moving ahead with this. It's meeting environmental standards, reducing greenhouse gases, saving money, and reducing the amount of waste that needs to be managed as waste. Here is just a quick look at the 12 projects operating in this country now that are either converting waste to vehicle fuel that comes from landfills or that is are creating uh, uh, anaerobic digesters, putting separated organics in it, and then deriving the fuel. It is a growing industry, not only in this country, but interest is growing it around the world. Looking quickly at two projects here, uh, that show you the different types. Um, the city of Sacramento, California, they developed a project that involved construction of an anaerobic digester and the processing of separated organics. But the way that that project init was initiated was that the city of Sacramento said, we have a piece of land, and they put out a request for proposals and said, who wants to use it to do something that is environmentally forward-looking? And two companies came forth, Atlas Refuel, which is a waste hauler, and Clean World, which was building di an anaerobic digester systems. They made a proposal, which was accepted, and they are now, uh, with considerable fuel cost savings, collecting commercial organic waste, carrying them in the fuel, in the Atlas Refuel trucks and others that take it to the digester. The digester makes the fuel and the trucks are refueled with this clean fuel so you have a real closed loop system in this country. Um, and it's a good sized city. Um, this Fair Oaks dairy project is a very large dairy and there what they're collecting of course is the manures from the cows and they are converting that ultimately into fuel that is being used to buy their 42 long haul trucks to deliver the milk to processing plants across a three state region. So these are all commercially viable kinds of projects. You're going to hear in a minute about the St. Landry Parish project, which is uh, from 2008 to now growing effectively and a very exciting model for other medium sized communities. Um, we have only here a last couple of slides, one showing you the guide that Energy Vision has available on its website under publications. And that guide is very simple, step by step. What do you do to see if you have enough waste in your area to develop a program? RNG for the Pelican State. We are excited to be here working with Louisiana Clean Fuels and to show off the first project in the state. Uh, Louisiana is a major petroleum and natural gas producer. It has been a pioneer in fuels over the last hundred years. We're just adding one more fuel that Louisiana can take advantage of as well made from its waste, but a lot of petroleum. There is the state tax credit that Louisiana Clean Fuels talked about. You have a lot of facilities in this state that are wonderful potential targets for the collection of organics. 
And uh, it's just a very exciting area of potential that we hope will open up and be of great benefit to the state's businesses and municipalities. Um, renewable natural gas is really the only fully sustainable fuel av available today. Um, that is something that is important for today's economy, for today's environment, but we want to remind you with this one little photograph here that we are safeguarding this world for future generations, and this strategy used all over the world can play a big role in doing that. If you want further information on Energy Vision, please do visit our website, energy-vision.org, or phone our offices and speak to either me or my colleague, Matt Tomic, uh, who has been running our day-long workshops and is our supreme expert on all the projects going on around the United States. Now I would like to turn this program over to Katri Martin to talk about the St. Landry Parish project. Katri? Uh, thank, thanks, Joanne. It's certainly a, a pleasure to be here. Um, we can get to the first slide. Okay. Um, we're with the St. Landry Parish All Waste Commission. We're located in South Central Louisiana. Um, we have a, a wet, warm climate. Getting biogas out the landfill is, is not very difficult for us to do. Uh, I'm going to follow these slides the way they are. 2015, this year we um, we negotiated a fuel purchase agreement with Progressive Waste. We were excited about that because Progressive agreed to bring in a full new, a new fleet of um, compressed natural gas vehicles. Uh, we agreed to expand our conditioning capacity and uh, provide the fuel that those trucks needed in addition to uh, 20 or so utility vehicles that we have in our fleet along with the local law enforcement and other municipalities. The, um, this expansion began back in December when we awarded a contract to Cornerstone and Vaughn Mill doing businesses bio C and G uh, to deliver um, what they call a bio C and G 100. That's a conditioner that will uh, condition at the rate of 100 CFM of landfill gas, it produces about 20 gasoline gallon equivalents per day. Uh, part of our expansion, as you can see in the photograph, included um, the addition of a large high volume low pressure vessel. Uh, what we're finding in our small project is that uh, in order to make it successful, we had to have the fuel available for delivery because uh, we decided to go fast fill. We, we did not put in an overnight fill island where the trucks would stay parked and fill over time. We wanted those trucks to unload, to fuel, and to leave the facility. All this um, and equipment and the fuel, fueling ability is done here on site. The, uh, the high the high volume, low pressure storage vessel will hold about an additional 400 gasoline gallon equivalents of fuel uh, in awaiting compression. The, um, the agreement with Progressive was backed up by the construction of a satellite outpost or a location in the city of Opelousas it gives us the ability to fuel on natural gas if for any reason the system at our site does not deliver the fuel. We couldn't take a risk if those garbage trucks couldn't, uh, couldn't operate on any given day. Um, we brought in uh, a tractor trailer. It's a tube trailer. You'll see it on the bottom left of the screen. That trailer will provide us a mass amount of storage at the landfill, and it also is mobile. If, if at any time uh, we want to deliver renewable natural gas, which is our intent long term, then all we have to do is hook onto it with a hazmat driver and take that 
trailer to the satellite outpost, attach it to the system, disconnect from the natural gas line, which is nothing more than uh, a button or a valve, and fuel renewable natural gas to the general public. Uh, that, that, was a, that was important to the district here uh, because the district serves the same constituency as all the parish public officials. And um, if it's good for any other public agency, it's good for the district and vice versa. So uh, a long-range plan certainly was to make nat renewable natural gas available, not only to the general public, but easy access for um, for the local mu municipal jurisdictions. The um, shot here is a is a complete uh, picture of the station here at the uh, landfill site. We're about halfway up the, the slope. The in the foreground you'll see our our gas collection system. It was installed back in 2008. Uh, in anticipation of um, the EPA regs that require landfills at some point to collect gas. However, when we installed it, it was done so voluntarily. Um, that voluntary um, status gave us the ability to market carbon offsets uh, to the extent that we were able to pay off the gas collection system. So as part of the um, the budget, so to speak, for the project, we do not include the cost for the installation of the gas system uh, because that's already been bought and paid for and at some point will be required re under the regulatory guidelines. Now, here's a shot of both locations. Um, these trucks that you see that are fueling have only been in service for about six weeks. Um, only a few of the trucks are, are in. The rest should be in by the 1st of October, which is the onset of the contract that we have for fuel purchase. Uh, we also are converting garbage collection services to automated. As you can see, the Karata cans are hanging up inside those trucks with the automated um, tippers on. So we're excited about this. Not only do we get to market the renewable natural gas, uh, on a large scale, but we're also able to, um, to give the people in the parish a, a better uh, collection service. The uh, the top right photograph is a satellite outpost. It's a uh, natural gas tie-in at the moment, but it it uh, is designed to receive renewable gas with the uh, mobile transport unit. The um, bottom left is the new dispenser unit that was installed at the landfill site. Uh, it can be accessed on both sides and two trucks can fuel at simultaneously because we've added the additional um, storage volume. In the background you see some of the um, sulfur treat vessels and the conditioning equipment. Talk a little bit about the, the dollars and cents. Uh, phase one was built back in 2012. At the time, we were fortunate to subsidize that project um, to the tune of about a half million dollars, which made um, getting it off the ground uh, much more palatable for our board of commissioners. Uh, based on our low consumption rate, because we estimated that our, our use would be about 20,000 gallons a year. It didn't quite get to that point after we, we learned how challenging it was to keep the original converted vehicles um, on the road. Uh, we have since added some utility vehicles, and, and that's now exceeded the 20,000 gallon mark. But early on, we really um, planned to pay off the investment in seven years. Now, our um, Operating costs were up at about $1.60 a gallon. That was basically because of the economies of scale. Uh, right now, we're at about 40,000 DGEs. Our price per gallon is down to about $1.20. Now, with the phase two complete at a cap cost of $2.7 million with no subsidy, uh, we believe our operating costs will be down to about $0.85 cents a gallon. Uh, that's a gasoline gallon equivalent. 
uh, with a fuel consumption, annual fuel consumption of about 175,000 gasoline gallon equivalent. Um, added to that, the dollar and a half environmental incentives, which uh, we explained to Energy Vision yesterday that we have been successful in generating the RINs under the RFS2 program, and actually we've had uh, successful sales of those RINs, um, and now we are, we're accumulating those at a rate of about um, 4,000 uh, RINs a month. So it, in our project, it becomes significant. But we hope to pay back all our capital costs in a period of 10 years. Our waste collection contract, however, is only for seven years. But the commission's made a commitment to, uh, to require that anybody else doing business uh, for the district uh, would need to use compressed natural gas in their fleet, uh, generated by the St. Landry Parish landfill. Um, this, um, uh, the success of this project, and we believe it's a success because at, at the end of four years now, we're continuing to fuel, and our fuel capacity is increased as well as the number of, of fleet vehicles. Um, it is important that whoever um, is responsible to operate the system understands it thoroughly because um, there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, but it's doable. We do this in-house. We have staff people that, are, that have the skill set and are trained to manage the uh, not only the gas collection system, but also the uh, fuel conditioning and the dispensing as well. Uh, and in our case, and it'll be that case in, in digesters, landfill gas or digester gas composition is key. Uh, we were fortunate. Uh, in our area, we have uh, probably above normal organic composition in the waste stream, and it makes it um, a situation where we can generate high-quality landfill gas. Our methane content is closer to 60 percent than 50 uh, percent as it is in most landfills. Uh, but we do do a good job in, in monitoring our gas field. Uh, to make sure that, that stays that way. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the fleet, and I think you have someone behind me here who's going to talk a little more about that as well. In, in our particular case, back four years ago when we first converted vehicles, um, those original kits were not uh, apparently built to last. Uh, we had difficulty because the first vehicles we used were used vehicles. And if the vehicle itself is not well maintained, you're, we were, uh, you're asking for problems, uh, which did occur. Uh, since that point in time, we, we've developed a relationship with, um, with a fleet dealer uh, in our local area who does acquire and sell uh, natural gas vehicles. And um, these vehicles today, the, the technology proved to the point where um, our problems with fleet management has virtually dissipated, uh, so we think we're past that curve as well. Now, our operating costs, well, you know, it can fluctuate considerably because if you have a, a one compressor go out, especially on a small project, you, uh, you're caught for a, a high-end expense. But um, it is important that, that we maintain our operating costs as well as possible. We, we do. Uh, we're carefully about careful about re allocating our resources uh, to the project. We do our own work in house. Um, media replacement and gas sampling is key. Uh, a lot of this took place because our project was um, was a pilot. We were actually breaking ground with the manufacturer. We learned about um, fueling vehicles at a time when the technology was really just getting started, a small scale, compact. And um, well, we spent quite a bit of time assisting the, the developer in, in keeping up with uh, improvements to the uh, equipment. Going forward, pretty straightforward, we're going to monitor this project expansion as we have 
uh, our original uh, project work, track that operating costs, and we will continue to work to expand the fleet. And by that I mean uh, we we are having dialogue with the school district about transportation for for um, for students, uh, school buses. Uh, we're also working with our other public jurisdictions to rotate natural gas vehicles in because we can provide the renewable natural gas uh, very uh, much more conveniently than uh, than having to require them to fuel 20 miles up the highway here at this site. I've included also, like the rest, uh, con uh, contact information. Some of our partners in crime. Um, you'll see there we have a uh, an engineer of record, in Oakland Associates, GT Environmental Finance. They're a carbon developer or a carbon broker. They handle the, um, the RENs and the carbon offsets. The DNR has been gracious with funding in the past. Cornerstone Environmental uh, providing equipment, and Franklin Engineers. That's our Air permitting um, guru. So, but that said, um, that's that tells our story, and we're open for questions at the end of this. Okay, Bob. Yeah. This is, so I will spend just a, a couple of minutes on some of what's available on the vehicle side and. Uh, leave some time here for questions, so I'll go pretty swiftly. Um, NetG is a um, vehicle upfitter and fuel station solutions builder, and uh, we're based in Houston. We do a lot of work for um, folks in Louisiana, particularly through, as Catherine said, um, uh, dealerships like uh, and, uh Ford. Um, and so we are a Ford factory system provider uh, for with a wide variety of um, system options for a broad range of trucks. The really exciting thing about what's going on in natural gas vehicles today is just the broad range of vehicles that are now available, especially on the Ford side and also on the GM side uh, from a fleet perspective that uh, have natural gas systems available for them. On the Ford side, everything, including now the new F-150 5 liter that's coming out here just in about a month or so is going to have a Ford factory approved natural gas prep system on it. So everything from the F-150 all the way up to the F-750 is now available in natural gas uh, along with the, the small and large transit vans and, um, and, and the cutaway vans as well. So four fleets on a full range of gasoline vehicles from half tons all the way up to the large 750s. We now have natural gas systems available that are fully factory warranted and have um, uh, just a really broad range of options for tanks, for service bodies, and so forth. Uh, the systems have become dramatically more reliable uh, as we've moved into Ford factory systems. The um, industry has now got a much more reliable product out there, and it's becoming increasingly cost effective across the board. Um, on the General Motors side, again, we've got, and hopefully I can make my slides move here, um, it seems to be a tiny bit difficult. Can somebody pop that slide? There it goes. Whoops, I think we went two there. <laughs> it just didn't want to move, and now it's moved a bunch of times. So I don't know if we can go back. But on the General Motors side, we have a similar story. We have a broad range of, uh, of um, the vehicles that are available from half-ton vehicles all the way up to the larger six-liter General Motors truck. and uh, and again, we also have a suite of small SUVs, uh, full-size SUVs available for police and, and other applications. So there really is a broad range of natural gas vehicles available for the full range of Ford and GM uh, products. They're almost all available with a couple of exceptions as high fuel vehicles so that you have the flexibility to run both gasoline and natural gas. Um, and so there, there, um, there, there really is for fleets today a broader range than there ever has been of high quality systems that are available. In addition to the, uh, in, in addition to the gasoline vehicles, there are a range of, and I don't know if there's, if there's a way to get that slide to go back one, but I'm going to ask if somebody can try. Oh boy, that's just jumping all over, isn't it? Um, so, so there, there's also a range of dual fuel and repowers available. For the older model vehicles, uh, uh, diesel vehicles, there are options 
to either replace the engine with a natural gas dedicated engine or have a dual fuel or blended fuel diesel system for the large 15 liter uh, diesel powered trucks that enables you to keep your existing vehicles and start using natural gas today without having to replace your entire vehicle fleet. That's an enormously important, uh, that's an enormously important opportunity for fleets as you've got five, seven, eight-year-old vehicles that still have another 10 years of life left in them, especially on the big trucks, to be able to go in and put a dual fuel system that allows you to, to drive 100% diesel when you're away from the natural gas and 50% natural gas when you've got access to it um, without losing any power or torque. So these systems are increasingly um, available for the larger engines and then the dedicated repowers on the smaller engines like the school bus engines and um, so forth. So again, a broad range of opportunities for both in-service and for new vehicles across the board. Um, and the next slide just shows some of the broad range of service bodies and other options that are available for the, um, for, for the different kinds of trucks, from police vehicles through box trucks and so forth. NETI also does provide fueling solutions. Uh, again, the exciting thing about the fueling solution opportunities today are that they come in everything from five gallons an hour up to 10 gallons a minute. There's just a very, very broad range of different options that are modular. Now, as we talk about renewable gas, of course you have to be at the landfill. What these stations do for non-renewable gas is to be able to hook up the pipeline and do a time fill at a remote location to supplement your natural gas, um, to, to supplement your natural gas usage from public stations that are at landfills. Um, but again, the, the really the key message here is that natural gas fueling stations now come, you know, from twenty-five thousand dollars up to two million dollars, and with almost every variety in between. Uh, that allows you to um, uh, that allows you to fleet fuel your fleet. As an example, we're running about 125,000 gallons a year on a $160,000 station down at Apple Towing in Houston, running 12 F750s. So there really are a wide range of options for on the fuel fueling side to fit your needs. Uh, so I, I think I'll leave it there, except to just say again, Magi full full service turnkey service provider both on the maintenance side and of course on the new vehicle side and um, we offer a very broad range of vehicle options uh, that and fueling station options that can fit really any need depending on what the fleet to what the fleet needs. Okay. Great. I'm gonna just stop there, yeah. <laughs> Thanks Bob. Um, so now we'll open it up for uh, any questions. And uh, we actually already have one question in, and this is for you, Katri. Um, what has uh, the community response in your area to your RNG project been? Well, uh, because our Board of Commissioners represent a, a good cross-section of our community, certainly it, it began with the Commission who, um, who have bought in completely into this process. Well, Twofold. One, they believe that they may develop some reasonable revenue stream over time, and secondly, to do their part as they as they own and operate a, a waste disposal site to to um, make sure that, that we remain environmental friendly. Uh, our community, via the students primarily, have embraced the work we've done here at Solid Waste over the years. Uh, this is no exception. Uh, they're inquisitive. They're excited, and they're actually proud because they um, they're very protective of um, of these of these not just just the other projects that we've been involved in. So it's been well and widely received by the community. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions? Any of our presenters want to give any last words? I wanted to mention, this is Joanna Underwood, just that Katri also indicated to us when we saw the site yesterday that there were school children, thousands of them, coming every spring to see the site, and that St. Landry's has developed under Katri Martin a real curriculum for the schools, a study process, so that children can learn to understand that waste isn't waste, 
that it can have great value and that you can in fact acquire clean natural gas without any drilling at all, just by making it out of the organic biogases. And I thought that this indicated the potential for wider use of using those educational materials in other schools in Louisiana and having students from other schools come uh, from around the state to look at the site because this is an emerging fuel of the future and it will be a very important part of the sustainable societies worldwide um, in this new century. And so that's my only concluding comment here for Energy Vision is that Matt Tomek, my colleague, and I are available to respond to any questions you have about this project or project across the country. The best information you'll get on this project is from Katri Martin himself, and we thank him for setting a really pioneering example, not just, as I say, for Louisiana, but for our country and what can be done in every small and medium-sized community to turn their waste into a valuable energy product. Also, if I, if I could conclude, um, I'd like to thank uh, Joanne, especially, and congratulations, Joanne, for the, for the recognition you've received, uh, well-deserved. But I'd, lo I'd also like to, to thank Bob and his staff, because, you know, Nat G do does and did provide our, our uh, conversion services. Uh, without people like Bob and, and his team, uh, things things that we do wouldn't wouldn't be quite as uh, quite as successful. Uh, certainly, we work well through a, a, a local dealership uh, who has a relationship in, in natural gas vehicles. Also, uh, the people at Clean Fuels and you guys are great. Uh, keep up the good work, and uh, I'm sure we'll be visiting again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if anyone else has any questions, you can just type them into the chat box. Should be on the right side of your screen. Patrick, can you talk a little? This is Anne. Um, could you talk a little bit about your um, the initial vehicles that you had fueling at the um, at your facility with, with Phase One? Uh, I know you talked a little bit about the refuse trucks that are going to be fueling um, you know, with Phase Two, but uh, can you give a little bit of the history? Well, when we when we brought the pro first project online, phase one, um, we entered into an understanding with the local law enforcement because um, the sheriff had the biggest fleet in the parish. Uh, he he made available um, a dozen uh, both sedans and pickup trucks, one uh, dedicated van, uh, as well as a handful of trucks, pickup trucks that we have, which were all used vehicles primarily. Uh, we had to um, search diligently because uh, certified kits were not readily available for these vehicles. Uh, it took us several months uh, to complete that conversion. We actually had a local business, uh, small business that did the conversions here in our area, and we brought them online. Uh, but about after six months, we had some challenges with the uh, used the older vehicles and the interface with the computers that were on them. Uh, but as Bob said, today you can get those uh, multitude of vehicles that are prepped, ready for natural gas conversion, and uh, and run uh, error free. So, but we did have a, a good relationship with the sheriff, and he, uh, we believe he still is interested in expanding that fleet now that we have access to fuel nearby. Fantastic, and especially with the greater vehicle availability these days. Thank you, Katri. Okay, unless we have any other questions, I believe that will conclude our webinar. And we will provide, we will email and provide a link to this recorded session on louisianacleanfuels.org.